This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Click the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen to get a week for free, plus 25% off a premium annual subscription. Hey guys, it's Richard, you're watching The Plain Bagel. I'm back from some time off that I took at the beginning of the year, so uh, happy to see you guys again. Happy 2024 to you. And while I was away, while I didn't actually plan on posting in January, there was a story that occurred during my uh, vacation that I figured was worth addressing. And that is around the topic of Bitcoin. Because you might have noticed that Bitcoin's had a very strong rally over the last five months or so, increasing from a base of around $26,000 in August to recently as high as $49,000 in 2024. And while it would be kind of foolish to attribute all of this movement to a single factor, uh, it does seem that an important variable with the rally we've seen has been the approval of a Bitcoin spot ETF or exchange traded fund, uh, which we actually saw take place on January 10th. And some believe this ETF approval signals the beginning of widespread adoption and that it's sure to lead to the price of Bitcoin skyrocketing from here on out. But what's interesting is that ever since the launch of these Bitcoin spot ETFs, Bitcoin's price has actually fallen, with some claiming this is traders taking profits off the table after a strong rally, while others have pointed to more one-off factors to why Bitcoin's price has fallen despite this generally positive update. Now, as everyone's favorite Bitcoin spokesperson, I know you've all been waiting eagerly for my input on all this. I know I'm generally viewed as a Bitcoin bear, given that I've posted videos in the past highlighting the risks of investing in assets like Bitcoin, and I don't hold it myself, uh, something that hasn't changed because an ETF was launched. But the goal of this video isn't to take a positive headline and to try and spin it into a negative, but it is still somewhat of a party pooper video, staying true to my roots, uh, given that a lot of people have taken this news about Bitcoin spot ETFs being released and really hyped it up to a ridiculous level. Leading up to the launch, people were really pushing the idea that these ETFs would be the floodgates opening, the righteous event that would finally draw in the institutional capital to Bitcoin and send everyone to the moon. And even though the price has since fallen, we've still seen people really holding on to that belief, arguing that any day now, once this noise passes, we're going to see Bitcoin's price surge. And so with this video, my goal isn't to tell you to buy or sell Bitcoin, but just to provide more information, to explain what the Bitcoin spot ETF is, how it differs from what we've already seen in this space and, and why it might be a benefit, but also to explain why we've seen the price of Bitcoin fall since the launch of the ETFs, not to predict where it's going to go from here, just to explain what we've seen so far. But let's start by giving a bit of context about what's going on here. Uh, for a long time, the Securities Exchange Commission has been generally opposed to Bitcoin spot ETFs. An ETF or exchange traded fund is simply a pool of investments that trades on an exchange much like a stock would. And a spot ETF specifically really just means a fund that actually goes, buys and holds the asset in question. It's dealing in what's called the spot market, which just means paying cash for acquiring something immediately. And the SEC's main argument against spot BTS for Bitcoin was that I didn't believe these products could effectively avoid manipulative or fraudulent activity, given that it trades outside traditional regulated markets on other networks and exchanges that don't have surveillance sharing agreements. So while I've seen companies try to launch Bitcoin spot ETFs in the past, they've all previously been rejected. But you might be thinking, Richard, that doesn't make sense. I I've seen Bitcoin ETFs before. And you'd be correct because in the past, the SEC did approve what's called a Bitcoin futures ETF, uh, which doesn't actually hold Bitcoin itself, but rather derivative contracts that are based off of Bitcoin's price. For example, there was the ProShares Bitcoin futures ETF with the ticker BITO that was launched a few years ago. And what might sound weird that the SEC would approve a derivative contract of Bitcoin but not a Bitcoin spot ETF itself. Uh, the argument was that the futures contracts already traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, and already sort of had the proper surveillance and infrastructure involved with these derivative contracts that Bitcoin itself did not have. But then came along Grayscale, a company that uh, last we know owned 3.4% of outstanding Bitcoin. And when they had their own application rejected, they actually appealed the decision, arguing that if you're going to approve futures based ETFs, then you sort of have to approve a spot ETF given that the two markets, the spot market and the futures market, have very similar pricing mechanisms for Bitcoin itself. With Grayscale claiming that there was actually a 99.9% .9 correlation between spot and futures market pricing. And it appears that the courts agreed with them because on August 29th, Grayscale actually won their appeals case, which forced the SEC to review Grayscale's spot ETF application 
and basically either approve it or come up with a better reason for rejecting it. And leading up to this approval, there was a lot of speculation around the launch of Bitcoin ETFs and, and the approval. Headlines were coming out about which asset managers were submitting spot ETF applications and acquiring Bitcoin positions. The cryptocurrency rose 80% from the time of the appeals case victory to just before the ETF approval. And on January 9th, we actually saw Bitcoin's price surge to nearly $48,000 after the SEC's X account tweeted that the spot ETF had been approved only for the price to correct downwards shortly thereafter, as it turned out that the tweet was fake and the account had actually uh, been compromised, allegedly because the SEC didn't have uh, two-factor authentication. But it turns out that the fake tweet wasn't actually that far off because a day after on January 10th, we did actually end up getting approval for Bitcoin spot ETFs on the market. Now, despite Grayscale doing all the heavy lifting here, the SEC actually approved a total of 11 spot Bitcoin uh, exchange traded funds, including BlackRock's iShares Bitcoin Trust, ARK's 21 shares Bitcoin ETF, and Fidelity's Wise Origin Bitcoin Trust. And that's really the main story here. As for why people view this as being a positive for Bitcoin, it really just comes down to the idea that Bitcoin is now easier to gain exposure to for investors, and that should draw in more people into the space. Historically, anyone could buy Bitcoin, but it came with a large learning curve, and it isn't exactly the most user-friendly experience for buying and storing, uh, especially given that if you happen to lose your private key, you lose all your Bitcoin. And while there have been a lot of companies that have entered the space of cryptocurrencies to try and make the trading and storing of, of cryptocurrencies easier, we've also seen a lot of customer funds lost uh, by these companies as there's just not the same sort of regulatory framework uh, to dictate how these exchanges and wallets operate, which allowed companies like FTX to get away with blatantly defrauding its customers. With the launch of Bitcoin spot ETFs, however, investors can now buy Bitcoin as easily as they would buy stocks while leaving the custody of the cryptocurrency to a traditional, well-regulated financial institution with a longer track record of uh, not stealing their customers' money and uh, more of the safety nets that, again, come with working with a traditional player. And with this news, again, a lot of adamant Bitcoin supporters are expecting a wave of new investors who might have otherwise avoided cryptocurrency to now surge into the space. But so far, that's not really what we've seen play out. In fact, while the price of Bitcoin did jump shortly after the announcement of the ETF approval, it's since fallen from that high of nearly $49,000 to below $40,000 over the span of just a couple of weeks. And to be clear, that is a marginal correction when compared to the past six months we've seen, but might be shocking to someone who expected, again, the floodgates to open as this ETF launched. So what's going on? Why is Bitcoin's price not catapulting from here? Well, before getting into the arguments around fund flows, which have really dominated a lot of the online conversation with Bitcoin, first thing to note is that with the cryptocurrency being up over the past five months in connection to this launch, there is a chance that traders are now simply using this opportunity to take their profits, buying the rumor and selling the news, so to speak, especially given that there's now more liquidity in the market to help them do so. And that's something to keep in mind with the markets is that they are forward looking. Given that a lot of investors and traders expected an eventual ETF approval, uh, the price had already adjusted accordingly to that. Uh, so from this point moving forward, the price of Bitcoin isn't going to go higher because that approval actually happens per se, uh, but rather whether the approval and the resulting flows will surpass or fall below what the market expectations were. It's why you really shouldn't put any stock into the claims that Bitcoin having events, for example, are big catalysts for the cryptocurrency's price. Because any Bitcoin trader today who's selling Bitcoin obviously knows that that event is coming up and is going to account for that in the price they charge for their Bitcoin. Traders will already bake market expectations into the price of the assets they sell. And to that, the second point worth highlighting is that now that we've seen the spot ETFs enter the market, it appears that they might not have necessarily met expectations, which could be contributing to Bitcoin's price falling uh, marginally. Well, we did see a ridiculous $4.6 billion in trading volume on day one of the spot ETF uh, trading day. This volume accounts for both buying and selling activity. And it does seem like a lot of the volume we've seen has simply been money moving between the different Bitcoin funds. And when you look at net inflows for spot Bitcoin ETFs, it stands at just $824 million for the first 10 days, which is a lot to be clear, especially when compared to traditional ETF launches, uh, but is a lot less than a lot of people forecasted. Especially when you consider that that ProShares Futures ETF uh, that was launched in 2021 saw more inflows itself over its first two days than the spot ETFs have cumulatively seen over their first 10 days. And ironically, at the center of a lot of this is Grayscale itself, 
losing a bunch of its customers because even though it prompted the event that allowed for these spot ETFs to enter the market, it's actually seen roughly $4.4 billion in net outflows from January 11th to the 24th, single-handedly offsetting most of the area's inflows, which uh, that sucks, <laughs> but it makes sense when you look into it because Grayscale's Bitcoin fund is actually quite expensive. It charges an MER of 1.5% annually, uh, which is quite a lot for a fund that effectively just buys and holds a single asset. Now they promised to lower this fee, but already the new spot ETFs are charging lower MERs and even at times waiving part of their fee, while ARK is waiving its entire fee until it reaches certain benchmarks. So naturally, when all these funds are offering effectively the same sort of ETF, uh, price is going to be one of the main competitive factors. And we've seen a lot of people leaving Grayscale's product as a result of that. And if that wasn't harsh enough for Grayscale, they've also been suffering thanks to a more one-off selling event, as we've since learned that the estate for FTX was actually a relatively large holder of the Bitcoin fund. And the defunct crypto exchange actually accounts for roughly $1 billion of these outflows as the platform is liquidating its holdings as part of bankruptcy proceedings. The 800 million in net flows also doesn't account for sales from futures-based ETFs, which investors are seemingly switching out of in a similar fashion to enter the spot ETFs, with the ProShares ETF itself seeing hundreds of millions of outflows, likely further contributing to the disappointing performance. Now, there has been a really popular narrative circulating that we haven't yet seen the sales from Grayscale being put back into the other Bitcoin spot ETFs because of wash trade rules, which would suggests that after 30 days, we will in fact see the floodgates open and the dream is still alive. But that's not how it works. Uh, wash trade rules don't prevent traders from buying and selling substantially identical ETFs. It just prevents them from recognizing a loss on that position if they sell and then buy back in right away, which wouldn't matter if you're up on the position or trading in a registered account. So it is likely that a lot of these outflows have already been reinvested. And that ties into the third point as to why Bitcoin's price likely isn't taking off. Uh, which is that the spot ETFs aren't likely as big of a step for drawing in new investors as past innovations have been. As mentioned, there have already been investment products that provide exposure to Bitcoin. That's not to say that spot ETFs don't come with their own advantages. They do tend to track more accurately. And that's why we're seeing money leave the futures ETFs and entering the spot ones. But clearly it was already easy enough to get Bitcoin exposure if you really wanted it. Especially when you consider that in addition to the funds like Grayscales that operated on over-the-counter markets, Spot ETFs were already available in other markets, like here in Canada, where we've had spot Bitcoin ETFs since 2021. So anyone with access to Canadian markets would already have access to this vehicle. Finally, the fourth reason why we haven't seen Bitcoin's price skyrocket thanks to the release of these spot ETFs is that there are still a lot of challenges that exist uh, towards widespread adoption. For one, the SEC has made it uh, very clear that they're still very cautious about Bitcoin. In fact, after making the approval, the SEC chair Gary Gensler wrote in a press release, quote, Bitcoin is primarily a speculative, volatile asset that's also used for illicit activity, including ransomware, money laundering, sanction evasion, and terrorist financing. And while a lot of advocates believe that's only a matter of time before professional advisors start warming up to Bitcoin and uh, recommending it to their clients and their institutional funds, it'd be unlikely to see that sort of widespread stance when you have the regulator of securities in the US still pretty publicly warning investors about the risks of Bitcoin. On top of this, a lot of Wall Street companies have actually abstained from allowing their clients to buy Bitcoin products, including Vanguard, Merrill Lynch, Edward Jones, and Northwestern Mutual. And even if we got to this point where Bitcoin sort of broke into the mainstream and was accepted as a viable investment asset, sort of similar to gold, if you will, it's likely that unless we had this sizable shift in how funds operate, most of them probably still wouldn't hold it. And that's simply because assets like Bitcoin, which don't have underlying cash flows, simply don't fall in line with the money manager's investment mandate. Less than 31% of pension funds, for example, own any gold. And of those, 69% have less than one to 2% of their portfolio in that asset. So while that's not to say that even breaking 10% of the market wouldn't be a huge success for Bitcoin, it is to say that anyone waiting for that widespread adoption where most funds have adopted Bitcoin is gonna be waiting a while. But that's the story and some of the explanations offered as to why we haven't seen Bitcoin's price skyrocket from here. And if there's any takeaways from this video, it's not that Bitcoin's going to correct or fall drastically in value. I don't pretend to know where investors are going to put their money in the future. And you know, maybe next time we talk about Bitcoin, it'll be double the price of what it is today. What I am trying to communicate, however, is that holding all else constant, 
this event isn't what's going to send Bitcoin's price skyrocketing. And realistically, your long-term thesis for buying and holding any investment, not just Bitcoin, uh, shouldn't really rely on these sort of short-term news headlines around money flows. Yes, institutional money entering a space or even retail money coming in can be really helpful for that asset's price. It doesn't guarantee its long-term success. ETF flows are not the entire Bitcoin market. The daily trading volume for Bitcoin reported by Binance is around $20 billion. So clearly the ETF flows alone won't dictate where Bitcoin's price moves. And I appreciate that I've raised red flags about Bitcoin before, and I'll always caution investors who are eager to jump into the space to rein in their expectations. But this stuff really shouldn't be given the time of day if you're genuinely interested in Bitcoin's long-term value especially given that the idea of middlemen institutions charging a fee to monitor and hold your Bitcoin in an ETF seemingly goes against the whole point of Bitcoin. So as I've said in past videos, past returns do not predict future returns. You should not go into this space expecting to easily uh, double your money in the short term. And if you wanna invest in Bitcoin, all the power to you and genuinely good luck, uh, but it should be for a better reason than an ETF just got launched and uh, everyone's gonna buy in now. Ticket to the moon secured. Anyway, that's the video. Thanks for joining me today. Before I sign off, I do want to give a quick thank you to today's sponsor, Blinkist. Uh, during my time off, the vacation I went on, I spent some time starting some of the books on my uh, to-read list, a long list of economics and investing titles that I plan to get through in its entirety. Uh, and I didn't get very far. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the water and uh, not very book friendly. But I sort of highlighted why I like Blinkist. It's not to replace these books because I will get through them, but I don't have a whole lot of time to explore other books, especially in different subject areas, which is uh, where Blinkist sort of comes in. Blinkist is an app that pulls out the key ideas of non-fiction books that lets you read or listen to the findings in typically under 15 minutes. One of the books I recently listened to the Blinks for was Poor Charlie's Almanac by Peter Kaufman, which discusses the investment approach of Charlie Munger, a lifetime business partner of Warren Buffett, who just recently passed away. My favorite blink from that one is the best investors recognize their own psychological limitations and use them to their advantage, which discusses the idea of staying in your circle of competence and considering the factors that might be subconsciously influencing your investment decisions. But if investing in economics isn't your thing, they have a whole array of other topics as well. One of my resolutions for 2024 is actually to become better rounded on other subjects outside the world of investments and Blinkist really helps there because you can find titles on subjects like philosophy, politics, science, really, any topic you might find interest in. Not to mention a great feature of Blinkist is Blinkist Spaces, which lets you curate a list of books that you are interested in. And Blinkist Premium members can share this with friends and family who can then listen to the summaries themselves, even if they don't have a premium subscription. So it greatly increases the value of a single subscription. And if you want to try it out yourself, you can use the link in the description below or scan the QR code on screen to get a week for free plus 25% off an annual subscription. So thank you Blinkist and thank you guys for joining me today. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please do make sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. It does help the channel tremendously. And let me know your thoughts on the Bitcoin spot ETF or uh, Bitcoin as a whole. I do wanna try and cover the topic without bias. And, and part of that is being open to the discussion around Bitcoin. So I very much welcome any debate on the discussion. Thanks for joining me today. Really excited about some of the videos we have in the pipeline for 2024. But until I see you next time, stay safe out there.